Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Empower Living Podcast by Empower Life Church. We hope it blesses you. He is risen. Ah, there's a few Christians in the house. <laughs> Yesterday we had a celebration of life service for Bud Ramsey, and there was standing room only. The parking lot was packed. People came from all over. Such a beloved man, and I haven't shared this with anyone, but uh, prior to Bud had cancer, and it spread very, very quickly, and prior to uh, his passing, I spent some time with him at the hospital, and uh, we spent some time worshiping together, and in my 20-plus years of ministry, whether pastoring, evangelism, whatever, uh, I've never met someone who was not afraid at all of dying, and everyone has their journey when they're experiencing, they know they're going to go. And he was so assured that death was not the end. He was, he was so expected of waiting for Jesus on the other side. He, we prayed for his family. That's all he wanted me to do, just come and pray. Pray for my children. Pray for my daughter. Pray for my son. Pray for my grandchild. And I want you to know that death has lost its sting. This isn't all that exists. Some of us live as if all we have is this side of eternity, constantly stressed out about finances, we're overworking ourselves, we're exhausted all the time, our kids don't see us smile, we're not dating our spouses because we got to work, 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 not realizing that actually this side of eternity is just preparation for that day when we come into his presence filled with fullness of joy. Come on, church. We need to start living on this side of eternity as if we believed that we're going to spend the rest of our lives in eternity with Jesus. That's Christianity. Come on. All right. Turn with me to your Bibles to John chapter 14. And I do want to teach this morning. And I love Resurrection Sunday. I love everything about it. I love families gathering together to celebrate Jesus. I love, I even love the the little Easter, whatever, egg hunt at the end, you know. So many Christians get so worked up over like, you celebrate Easter. Ishtar, the fertility god of... Take a break. Listen, we celebrate family gathering together and the joy of little children searching for eggs. I don't know how, when the last... I mean, my mom probably hit our Easter baskets by the time we're 17, 18 years old, you know? (laughs) Honey, wake up. We're like, we're grown men. We're like, oh. There's like three spots, you know? It's in the, you know, she had to start getting creative and putting stuff in the oven, you know? Just do the whole thing. Just gather family around the resurrection of Jesus. What's better than that? John 14, I'm going to start off in verse 6, and I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. Jesus explained, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes next to the Father except through union with me. To know me is to know my Father too, and from now on you will realize that you have seen him and experienced him. Jesus is talking about a day that's coming. And that's the day that you and I presently live in. And it's the day that he is going to die on a cross, be resurrected, be seated at the right hand of the Father, pour his Holy Spirit upon his body, and share his life with us. That is the gospel message. Now, I want to read this to you. Uh, Here in John chapter 14, I got some notes. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not about good deeds, religious rituals, or anything else we can do on our own. It's only through faith in Jesus that we can have a relationship with the Father. Isn't that amazing? You know, I grew up with a beautiful grandmother who honestly taught me the love of God. Like, I don't know how many grandchildren Mama had, but she had one picture next to her bed, and it was of my face. (laughs) I look back at it and I'm like I know I was loved I'm 10 years old you know I was very picky eater I wish I still had that problem and my grandmother she she, (laughs) this is embarrassing this is going to tell you guys a little bit about me but all of you men here that are Hispanic or Italian or and you had a Spanish grandmother this might have happened to you she would take a piece of lettuce, wrap it in chicken, and she would hand feed it to me. 
at like 10 years old. I knew I was loved. Listen, right? But she was a Jehovah's Witness. And I remember as she was training me up, she used to prophesy over me. She said, someday you're going to be a preacher. She didn't realize that she was true, but I wasn't going to preach what they believed. Because as I began to get older and process with Grandma about her faith, and, and she did love Jesus, but all of the trappings of what they believed was that no one knew if they were saved or not. There was no assurance of salvation. It wasn't through Jesus alone that you inherit salvation. It was through knocking on doors. And I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. You can study it for yourself. It was through good works and possibly if you have enough doors that you've knocked on and you've converted enough people and handed out enough watchtowers that maybe when you get to heaven, you could be accepted. I want you to understand that is not the gospel. The gospel is there is only one way to the Father. And I want you to notice that it doesn't just say one way to heaven. The destination isn't only heaven. The destination is the Father. Whoo! We're going to dive into this deeper. Jesus does more than just take us to heaven. He brings us to next to, alongside of the Father. The Father is the destination. That's going to be the crux of where I'm going this morning. I want to read you a um, commentary. It says, Jesus is more... I just read it, sorry. Now I want you to look at verse chapter 8. Philip spoke up, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be all that we need. That is the cry of a generation. Statistically, right now, forget about Christianity, faith, whatever. Statistically, we are the most fatherless generation in history in America. The statistics have actually been stopped because of the, this kind of agenda that's been brought in. Uh, that's actually attacking a family, it's attacking a mommy, it's attacking a daddy, it's attacking the children. They've actually stopped doing statistics, so we actually don't know anymore. Uh, but the statistics are terrible at how many children are being raised without a dad. And we're seeing the effects of it. And if you're not seeing the effects of it, you're probably not working within health care, you're probably not working within being a teacher or within our education. I mean, you begin to see and notice the effects that are happening with kids that don't have a father. The world is crying out for this one thing. Who's my daddy? From the father comes a sense of identity, purpose, and protection. It doesn't mean that a mother doesn't, obviously the mom, she does all the work, right? Our moms are our heroes. But there's something that a father imparts to a child that actually, unless you're a single mother, I believe that God gives you grace to actually be able to impart, but that's not his original design. His original design is that you have a father and a mother, and that through the both of them walking in the nature and the image of God, a child grows up feeling safe, protected, loved, nurtured, disciplined, and in that home, they're being raised up. And in that sense, it becomes easy for them to say, I know that Jesus is good because my mom and dad were good to me. We need to restore once again the image of God the Father in our homes. That's the destination. That's what a generation is crying out. Show us the Father and we'll be satisf satisfied. Jesus replied, Philip, I've been with you all this time, and you still don't know who I am. How could you ask me to show you the Father? For anyone who has looked at me has seen the Father. What does that mean? We have a generation, maybe someone in this room, that is deconstructing their religion. And they're spending more time watching YouTube videos than they are fellowshipping with believers, sitting under teaching, gathering in corporate worship. They're deconstructing. They're deconstructing. They're isolating themselves, which one of the first assignments of the enemy is to get you to isolate and to be all by yourself. And somehow you will come to the conclusion alone, look at the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament, God is so angry. And how could you serve an angry God? Jesus in this statement is really challenging the religious view of what God is like. He's saying, Philip, how long have I been with you and you don't know what the Father's like? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
What in the world does that do with all the Old Testament passages of Scripture where it looks like God wakes up in the morning and he, has a, he goes to get a cup of coffee and the Keurig is run out of the pods. And, 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 he's, he, oh, and, he, and he goes to grind some beans, but the grinder's broken. And, and he's just like, oh, I don't want to get up and have to go down to the Starbucks and get a coffee. And then he's frustrated, and he stubs his toe, and he's so mad, and he sends down a plague upon Las Vegas. That is literally some people's image of God. What you have to understand when you're reading the Old Testament passage is something called progressive revelation. They did not yet know God. And he was revealing himself to them, not only in a way that, that they needed to see him, but in a way they could handle. This is really important. God reveals himself to them. They're in a culture where they actually had human sacrifices. So when God reveals himself to the people, he says, Abraham, take your son, your only son, take him to the mountain and worship there. The reason why Abraham was able to do that or willing to do that was because that was a culture where they would sacrifice their children to a God called Molech. So Abraham is like, well, God, you promised me a son. I'm in my 90s. It's a miracle that my wife and I could even procreate. So I'm going to obey you. However, you're going to raise him from the dead. This is what Abraham's thinking. You can see it in Hebrews. It actually says this. So now imagine Isaac. Hey, Dad, where's the sacrifice? He's like, oh. <laughs> he gets up to the mountain. Abraham takes his knife. And all of a sudden, God says, stop. And what we think is happening there is an angry, wrathful God who's putting Abraham to the test. What we don't understand is that was common. What was uncommon was for God to say, that's not what I'm like, Abraham. Go and take this revelation that I provide a ram in the thicket. I didn't have you kill your son. I want you to tell everyone that I am the God who provides. God is revealing himself throughout history as a God of healing, as a God of provision, as a God of love, until we get to the place where Jesus says, I am the perfect image and reflection of God the Father. So if your view of the Old Testament doesn't look like Jesus, then you have to go back and reassess your understanding. The scripture says that the law put a veil over our eyes. I'll give you another case in point. Uh, one case in point is a woman by the name of Ruth. It's the book of Ruth. And she's got this mother, uh, mother-in-law. And the story is, Ruth chapter 1, that Ruth's father-in-law and mother-in-law, they go uh, they leave Jerusalem, Judea, sorry, Bethlehem of Judea, and they go to Moab. Say Moab. Moab means, uh, children in the room, not these guys, but it means from my father. Moab was a place that was basically populated through the incestuous relationship of Lot and his daughters. Say nasty. God says, I don't want you guys with Moabs. I don't want you with the Moabites, all right? We are separating you from them. Well, I forgot his name right now, but, but Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi's husband, says, Come on, honey, I got a good idea. There's some money, 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 job, money, job, in where? Moab. Some people will do anything for money. They'll actually go to a place that God's not called them to. And they might get a little money, money, but they don't have internal peace. They go to Moab, and guess what happens? It's not funny, but the two sons die. What is kind of, maybe not funny, forgive me my weird sense of humor, is that their names are Machion and Chilion, which means sickness and dying. Be careful what you call people or what you name your children, all right? And so now, Naomi, which means pleasant and sweet, she comes back to Bethlehem, Judea, because guess what she hears? God is in the house. That's what she hears. There's fresh bread. The famine's over. So now she walks into Bethlehem of Judea, which she was never supposed to leave, like this. God doesn't love me. He, my kids died and nobody loves me. And she changed her name that day to Mara, which means bitter. The rest of her story is basically saying, God has left me. God has abandoned me. God never left her or abandoned her. He told her, don't 
leave Bethlehem, Judea. She left, and then all this happened. So when you read the book of Ruth, you're not seeing the nature and character of God. You're seeing what someone who walks outside of God's purposes for themselves is experiencing. She is projecting her hurt and her bitterness onto God's character. So when you're reading the scriptures, pay attention to who's talking. Job's story, he gives and takes away. Terrible song. Listen, not theologically correct. He gives his son and he takes away your sin. That is theology correct. Job is going through hell. Can I say that word? I can say it in church. He's going through a rough time. So Job is like, God, you have, you, what, you're, what you're seeing in Scripture is people's own wrestling with God. So what we've done, especially the neo-atheist movement and then the deconstruction movement, hooks onto their arguments like Dawkins and Hawkins, and they say, see, God is angry and wrathful. But they don't understand that the accounts of Scripture is the person's account of who God is like. If you want to know who God is like, Jesus says, look at me. That's theology. You didn't think you were going to get theology on Easter Sunday, did you? All right, I'm going to move on. Let's go to John 14, 16 to 20. Okay, I think I skipped quite a bit, but I'm going to do it. And I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another Savior or Comforter, the Holy Spirit of truth, who will be to you a friend just like me. He will never leave you. The world won't receive him because they can't see him or know him, but you know him intimately because he remains with you and will live where? Inside of you. Jesus is prophesying about what happens when he rose from the dead. And in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out and fills the church with his spirit. I promise, verse 18, that I will never leave you helpless or abandon you as orphans. I will come back to you. What is the condition, the present state of those that don't know Jesus as orphans? You know what's interesting? When you look at the definition of the word sin, one of the definitions of the word sin means to miss the mark. And then we go real deep theologically about if you break the law, you miss the mark. But what's interesting to me is even myself as a preacher, I never looked at the next definition, which means without error. Sin means without an heir. If, you have, if you're not an heir, it means you don't have a dad. I want to present to you this morning that Jesus didn't just die on the cross to forgive you of sin, and he did. And we'll look at that. But he died that you could come to a place of reconciliation with a good, good father, which is what the world is longing for. It's not this picture that's been painted by John Calvin and Anselm and many of the early church fathers where God is just angry, kind of like Zeus. Not like Jesus, but like Zeus. He's angry. He wants to, ah, wrath, judgment, anger. And Jesus goes, Dad, 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 he's with me. He's with you. Okay. That's the picture that the early church fathers, not, I'm not talking about the Bible, or even those who walked with Jesus. I'm talking about what's called the legalization of Christianity, where some of these really smart guys, they get around, they talk to each other, they have no experience of God, they just got big brains. How many know God loves big brains? How many know your big brain needs to be submitted to a bigger heart? This is important. This is a part of what's happening with the deconstruction movement, is you get a bunch of people that are bitter, that are hurt, they get together, and they just start tearing things down. And they say, see, I I watch this YouTube video. And it said that this particular place that's found in the Bible doesn't actually exist. And then I read that verse, and guess what it said? It's not there. Not there, see? God's not real. I have been talking to more and more people, 18 to 30, that are going through this journey. And I realized something. It has never went past mental ascent into believing your heart. Then confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart. means It goes past just the the, the black and the white on the page. There comes to be a a place in each one of our lives, according to Romans chapter 8, where the Bible says your heart cries out, Dad! 
It's like you're going to church, you're going through the whatever, mom's making you come, she's dragging you, you're going to youth group, you you know, you're just doing it maybe because you're an American or whatever you think you're supposed to. And something happens one day when you're worshiping the Lord and you just go, God, you know, I'm playing the, I'm going through the motions, I don't even know if you're real, my dad's a Christian, my mom's a Christian, my grandma, but I don't even know what I think about you. And and if you're real and if you're good, then why do people die? Why do people suffer? And you know, and, and you start all of a sudden, what people don't realize is what I just acted out is actually faith. Track with me. Journey with me. I was trained up. That faith looked like this. God is real. I believe him. I don't care what's happening in the world. I will not be shaken. So now people have to fake it till they make it. If you're having a crisis of faith, you have to pretend. You can't tell anybody in church that you're struggling with believing something. You can't because everybody's supposed to pretend. Brother, I would never doubt God, brother. Amen. The Bible says, you know who I am? The Bible told me. And, and, and what's re- really, that it's not just faith as a, as, a, as a destination. It is called a walk of faith. So true faith is the guy who is like, I don't know if I believe in you, but I'm talking to you right now. You know what? My favorite is, is agnostics, because agnostics, atheists often just don't know God. An atheist wasn't raised in a home where there's Christianity, they don't know. Agnostics, they believe there is a God, but they don't believe necessarily, they don't know who God is. However, if you talk to a true agnostic, they're always really angry. And I, I think it's hilarious, personally. I go, you seem really angry with a God that you don't believe in. That anger. I knew a guy, and he said, Ivan, I don't know about God, but one day I went up to the mountain, I took a rock, and I started throwing it at heaven. If you're real. I said, what are you doing in a Bible school? He goes, well, he revealed himself to me. (laughs) I think, church, we got to shake off this mask of perfection that we think we have to carry. And we have to start talking to the young men and the young women at the table in La Mesa and begin to have face-to-face experiences and tell them, listen, I had a time in my life where I struggled with my faith. There was a season where I wasn't sure if I believed. There was a season where, where I was praying for something and it didn't happen. And this is how God revealed himself to me. Instead of just pretending that we're all perfect. I believe that's why we see a generation that is like, They're having their own crisis of faith, but they don't have anybody, a mom and a dad, to sit and talk to and say, listen to me. This beautiful thing of covenant, you know what it means? Uh, There's a song. There's a lot of songs. I'm trying to think of the one I'm thinking of. It says, oh, no, I'll never let go through the fire, through the storm. Oh, no, I'll never let go. You never let go of me. And I remember... Uh, after seeing supernatural miracles and signs and wonders coming from third world nations. And I, I, for me, it wasn't so much does God exist. It, was, it wasn't that. It was more I felt like my faith had to be perfect in order for God to use me. And I remember having this experience, and I saw this vision of myself, and I was holding on to a mountain. And listen, for like a week, I did mountain climbing. Anybody ever do mountain climbing? Your fingers have to be so strong Like, that's real strength right there. You're like hanging off of a mountain with your little fingers. And so in this vision, I saw myself, and I'm like, that's exactly how I feel. I feel like I'm getting weak. I can't continue just waking up at 4 in the morning and praying and interceding. I used to fast every other day, and I used to at least tell somebody about Jesus. And I'm serious. that, That was my kind of initial walk. And I was like, God, I just feel like I'm getting tired, and, and nothing is changing around me. And in this vision, I saw my fingers slip, and this massive hand caught me. It's like, I've been waiting for you to come to the end of yourself. Some of you got to take a deep breath and chill out, and actually have an experience where you realize in covenant that even if you go, I'm tired, he goes, I'm here. It's a two-sided relationship. Your faith isn't just you by yourself. Some of us haven't experienced that. But I want to encourage you. There's a generation right now. I know what I'm doing. I'm a preacher. But I want to make more time in this season to just take young people, sit around the table, say, ask me anything. Ask me anything. Nothing is off limits. 
about my relationship with God, about my marriage, about my finances. Because what I'm realizing is when I was coming up, I had spiritual papas. They weren't perfect, but they would say, this is what it looks like to walk with Jesus. I re- <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't tell that, but anyway. I-, I remember going to this one pastor and saying, God's called me to be celibate. He laughed out loud. He said, boy, you can barely keep your eyes off of the, the, the single woman at, ch- at church now. You don't have the gift of celibacy. I was 20, for those of you looking at me weird. I've been married 18 years. My kids are in the back. But, but I needed a dad to go, if you had a gift of celibacy, you wouldn't be trying to give all the girls your phone numbers. Where's that person anymore? Those people are disenfranchised. Oh, stop it. The church is lacking mothers and fathers. So we're seeing a generation that is actually trying to figure things out by themselves where they should never have to figure it out by themselves. So we need the church to have a revelation of Abba, Father, Daddy, God. And when I see you, I want to be like you. And, And being a father means like I have sons and daughters. And I point them, not to myself, but I point them to the one who's been from the beginning. Amen. I want to tie this in here. Let me just read this to you. I promise I will never leave you helpless, abandoned, or as orphans. I will come back to you. Soon I will leave this world. This is past tense. And they will see me no longer, but you will see me because I will live again and you will come alive too. Say, come alive. This is what's happened when he rose. This is an Easter message, I promise. So when that day comes, you will know that I am living in the Father. Just let your mind go there. Jesus ascends to the Father. He's living in the Father. I have done so much study theologically about the Trinity, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and I've studied different... Just with me, go with me here in your imagination to God the Father. Not as a Zeus, but He's Spirit. He's a living Spirit. So I pick, because Jesus now, when he was crucified, the Bible says that he is in heaven now with a resurrected body. Isn't that amazing? So when you go see Jesus in heaven, he's going to have nail scars and a pierced side and scars in his feet. He's got a physical body. This is scripture. Some of you are looking at me like I'm being weird. I'm sorry, promise. I got education in the Bible. <sighs> Later on, we're going to get the snakes out and speak in tongues, I promise. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I want you to imagine Jesus, he, he, can't you imagine the day when he was resurrected from the dead and he comes home, how the angels must have rejoiced, how the Father must have, he never separated himself from Jesus. It's important that we understand God is spirit because when we try to think of the Trinity from the perspective of like, we're one, and you're bumping into each other because you can't really be one. No, we're talking about spirit. God is spirit. Jesus is physical flesh. I always pictured as Jesus walked into the Father, and the Father's glory enveloped him, and they're one. They're one being. Ha, oh, man. So we get that. I'm in the Father, and that you are with me. Okay. God is in the Father. How am I with Jesus? How am I with Jesus? Here's the piece that I want you to understand. It is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It is through inviting the Holy Spirit. He said, Jesus, come into my life. I make you Lord. I confess you, Lord. Forgive me of my sins. I want to be a new creation. I want to be born again. And we go, amen, brother. God has erased your sins from you. Just don't ever do it again. No, no, no. That's not what happens. He does forgive your sins. I'll read it. But what happens is his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living Christ, the one that raised Jesus from the dead, fills you. You ever see somebody truly born again? Have you ever seen somebody truly born again? I I remember, and I have to remind myself, of when I received Jesus and when I became born again because the grass was greener and the sky was bluer. And, and, and I just would look at people and I just, ah, you're so beautiful. I just love everybody. Then life happens and then we stop depending on the Holy Spirit and we start 
kind of focusing on the natural world. But listen, the Holy Spirit fills you, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ's Spirit, He is in me. I am in Him. So when that day comes, you will know that I'm living in the Father and that you are one with me, for I will be living in you. Resurrection Sunday. Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. There's an aspect that I want to teach you guys is that not only did Jesus die for your sins, he not only died for you, he died as you. You say, prove it, preacher. I'm glad you asked. I'm going to read you Colossians. All right. Next time you see me without my glasses, say, hey, Ivan. Uh. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live how? By faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus took upon him the sin of the world, that there would be no separation between him and us. In Colossians chapter 2, I want to read this verse. This will be the last verse that I read. Then you guys can all eat ham <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> I love Resurrection Sunday. Let me read it. Colossians chapter 2. It says this in verse 9. For he is the complete fullness of the deity living in human form. Jesus is the express image of the Father. I already taught that. Verse 10. And our own completeness is now found in him. Our completeness or our wholeness is found where? Come on, you guys are smart. We are completely filled with God as Christ's fullness overflows within us. He is the head of every kingdom and authority in the universe. Through our union with him, we have experienced, don't, I know this sounds weird, circumcision of the heart. It means to pull the flesh away. All of the guilt and power of sin has been cut away and is now extinct because of what Christ the Anointed One has accomplished for us. For we've been buried with him into his death. Our baptism into death also means we were raised with him when we believed in God's resurrection power. The power that raised him from death's realm, this realm of death describes our former state. We were held in sin's grasp. But now, we've been resurrected out of that realm of death, never to return. For we were forever alive and forgiven of all our sins. You say, where, where are you reading this from? The Bible. Colossians 2. This is the good news. Could you imagine if this is what we were preaching on the streets of Las Vegas? You don't know who your daddy is. I mean, I'm not saying that Las Vegas, you know what I'm saying. I was just in Vegas preaching at a church. I'm not saying all Vegas is bad. But some of these guys out there, they have these signs. You're going to go to hell. Repent and turn. Go to hell. How many of that doesn't work? Could you imagine just saying, you don't know who your father is. The reason why you're trying to fill it, this part of your heart that's starving is because you don't have that spirit of Christ living in you, making you complete and whole. And, and you know what would happen if you woke up in the morning and you're like, I'm forgiven. Whoa, his mercies are new every morning. You say, well, brother, be, be careful now. You're going to give people permission to sin. You know who the people who have permission to sin are? They're the people that are living with guilt and con sin consciousness. The person that feels shame and guilt constantly for their past will always go back there. But the person whose mind is what? Colossians 3 verse 1 set where? On things above where Christ is seated. You're not trying to fix yourself. You realize that you were created with a purpose. Sin, sickness, disease, death, poverty was taken on the cross. Now live! An empowered life. Hey, you see that? I've had to do that. Yeah. That's what it means. A resurrection life. 
where you're not trying to say, well, oh, priest, perdona me, padre, por, por, por I kick an old lady. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know what to say. Forgive me, father, for I have sinned. My child, make sure that you come to me because I want you to have complete dependency on me as your priest. No, Jesus says he's the high priest. Man, I want you to get this. All right, I'm almost done. He canceled out every legal violation we had on our record and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all. What does that mean? Here's what that means. Satan goes, hey, Jesus, you know that guy? Bobby Boucher, you know that guy? He cusses. He's a, he says a lot of cuss words, and, and it wasn't holy God, I'll tell you that, when he dropped that pen on his foot. And then Jesus says, He's mine. Any kind of accusation that you have against one of mine doesn't stand. I took those curse words on the cross. He belongs to me. Now as his dad, I'll deal with him. But you have no legal right to anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. You say, that's too good to be true. That's why it's called good news. Do you know who your daddy is? Do you know what he's done for you? He didn't just die to forgive you of your sins so that you could crawl on your knees upstairs in penance. Just maybe, maybe if you work hard enough or do just enough, maybe he'll forgive you. Maybe if you give enough money to the church. Maybe if you're, if you're nice to the home. Maybe, just maybe. No, Jesus took the sin of humanity upon him. He broke hell, death, the grave. He rose again and he says, listen, I did all that. Now all I want from you is to believe in me. The disciples, they're kind of religious. And they go, what is the work that you want us to do? And what does Jesus say? Believe on the one whom the Father sent. I want you to stand with me. Worship team, come up. There is a belief in God. It's not a perfect faith, but there is a belief in him that when I'm up or when I'm down or when I'm struggling or when I don't feel like the resurrection life of God is flowing through me, that I put my trust in him. That when I wake up in the morning, I'm not just counting. I I was taught every night before bed, you need to repent of every single sin you've ever done. So every night, God, I'm sorry. (laughs) <laughs> and that's beautiful sentiment. Now I go to bed every night telling Jesus what I appreciate about him. And all those sins that I was committing over and over again, they don't exist anymore because I'm not focusing on my good behavior. I'm focusing on his power to overcome. I want us to shift. We're going to do one song. Ministry team, I want you to come up to the front. If you are here this morning and you want prayer for anything, I don't care if you want prayer for your pinky toe, restored marriage, finances, anything. If you want to surrender your life to Jesus, we want to make that invitation to you. But I'm praying that all of you, when you leave here, your minds and hearts would be rattled with, what does it mean that my spirit and Christ's spirit have become one spirit? I just quoted you another verse. This is the good news. Lord, I thank you that my life that I now live, I live by faith. And Jesus, I pray this Resurrection Sunday that the revelation that you came to say, my dad is safe. My dad is good. Jesus came not only to save us from sin, but he came to save the world from a bad image of what God is like. He's good. He loves you. He's proud of you. He's not counting your sin against you. He wants you to come home. Just like my grandpa in his 90s. And when all the siblings and all the grandchildren and grandpa would sit at the head of the table and we'd all sit around the table together and he would tell stories. His heart would be full to have his whole family come. How much more God desiring that all of us Come to the table and just hear his heart. So I ask for that, Lord. Let us leave here with a fresh revelation. God is good.
He looks just like Jesus. Let's worship him. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Empowered Living Podcast by Empowered Life Church. We hope it blessed you. Subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about us, check us out at facebook.com slash ELC talent or check out our website www.empoweredlifechurch.org. Have a blessed week.